Okay, welcome to review on derivatives. First off, the first few pages I have here are going to be of things you should have memorized, but considering the format of this year's AP exam where you're allowed notes, um, all of this stuff might be ones you want as a quick reference guide, uh, starting with the limit definition of the derivative. Uh, the standard one most people go with is this one up top, limit as h goes towards zero of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. Uh, the limit of that function will give you the derivative of f. Uh, we do have those derivative shortcuts, but there are a number of AP questions which will often ask about the limit definition of the derivative. So having this available is really useful. There is an alternative definition, it's down here, limit as x goes towards a of f of x minus f of a all over x minus a. Um, that one could also be useful. If you want a review of where these limit definitions came from, feel free to shoot me an email. I'll make, be happy to make a separate video showing uh, where these de limit definitions came from to begin with. Sometimes it can be helpful to remind, remember that. Uh, quick recap, just to kind of jog people's memories if you're curious. Um, basically, it comes from something like this. Like if I wanted to find the slope of this function, at that point, we know so the slope formula is y2 minus y1 all over x2 minus x1. However, if I only have a single point, using this formula becomes hard because, well, this requires the slope formula requires two points. So I give myself a second point somewhere further on the line, and I say, all right, well, I can find the slope of that line using this formula. Of course, that line isn't the slope I want. I wanted the slope that goes right through that single point. But what happens is if I can take this point here and move it closer and closer and closer to that point there, the closer that point moves, the more accurate my formula for my value for the slope will be to the actual true slope of the tangent line. So this limit basically says, hey, I've got two points. Here's the point I'm looking for. And I've got this point a little bit further on, like, hey, call that x plus h. And we're having h go towards zero. So in other words, that difference between those two points is going closer and closer to a difference of zero. These points get closer and closer to becoming the same point, which ends up making this formula closer and closer to the slope of the at point the slope of the function at that particular point. Same thing for this one, except instead of having h goes towards zero, it just says having x go towards a. So if this is my point a and that's my point x, this x gets closer and closer to that value. All right, moving on here. Uh, these, let me clear those. <clears throat> These are a bunch of derivative rules you should also have memorized. Uh, we'll quick talk about some of them, especially ones that people forget. Derivative of a constant, you guys all know derivative of a constant is zero. Just remember that, keep that in the front of your mind when you're doing derivatives. A lot of times people will forget. And if you have something like, I don't know, y equals something super crazy, x squared plus five, they'll say, oh, well, y prime, derivative of x squared is 2x and they'll do 2x and then they'll be goofy and say plus 5 because they see that plus 5 there. Of course that's not true because the derivative of 5 is 0 since 5 is a constant so it's actually just 2x. So derivative of a constant know that that is 0. Uh, the power rule that's what I actually used here when you have a power here that 2 comes down and then you subtract 1 from the exponent you guys all know that one. Sum and difference rule we don't often reference basically it says if you take uh, the derivative of two separate functions that are being added, you can take the derivative of those separately. Um, that's why if I had, let's say y equals x to the third plus 2x squared, no, let's say, sure, x squared, I can take the derivative of this and the derivative of that and just my final derivative is those two derivatives added together, right? Y prime would be 3x squared, 4x, right? That's the sum and difference rule. Uh, the product rule is the important one to remember to know. If I had y equals, I don't know, x to the fourth times e to the x, 
That's a product. It requires a product rule. You might remember that little uh, mnemonic device, first times the derivative of the second plus second times the derivative of the first. The product rule is probably one I would highlight or otherwise star on a little note sheet uh, because people tend to just like, it slips people's minds. They forget about it. Like, hey, that product rule, it's a thing. And they just kind of forget about using it. So you might want to make sure you use that product rule. Or, sorry, might want to. You definitely want to use the product rule when it shows up. Same thing for quotient rule. Uh, if, you have, if you're taking the derivative of a fraction, right? You can't just take the derivative of the top and the derivative by the bottom separately. You got to use a rule. You might remember that shortcut, low d high minus high d low all over low squared. Um, definitely know those two. Apply them when they need to. Uh, chain rule, again, I'm going to highlight that one. That's also a major rule that people tend to slips people's minds sometimes. Don't forget chain rule. Derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside, you might remember. If I've got the derivative of a function inside another function, you take the derivative of the outside first. Inside stays the same, then times derivative of the inside. A uh, quick example for that, if you guys like. Uh, hold on. Let's just use the same text box. Let's say I had the sine of 3x to the third. Sure. Right? If I wanted to find the derivative of that, look on the outside function first. Outside function is sine, so the derivative of a sine is cosine. The inside stays the same, so cosine of 3x to the third. I don't stop there. Since there is something inside of that function, namely that 3x to the third, I have to take this whole thing and I have to multiply by the derivative of the inside. So times derivative of 3x to the third would be 9x squared. Right? Derivative of the outside, inside stays the same, times the derivative of the inside. All right. Moving on. Uh, your exponential rules, you definitely need to know all of those. Derivative of e to the anything is e to the anything times, again, if you had the chain rule, don't forget the chain rule. If I had y equals e to the, let's say, 2x, y prime would be e to the 2x, right? Derivative of e to the anything is still e to the anything, so it's still e to the 2x. But then times the derivative of the inside. Derivative of the inside is two, right? Derivative of two x is two. So I should have it being times by two. I like putting the two in front because, well, it just looks nicer there. Uh, if you have any other thing to the x power, like a to the x, um, well, let's put an actual number there. Let's say I had the derivative of eight to the x. I don't know, do eight to the two x, why not? Uh, it's the same, really, same rule, really. Derivative of e to the anything is e to the anything. Derivative of a to the anything is still a to the anything. So it'll be eight to the two x again. Same exact thing as before. However, there's a couple of things we gotta watch out for. First off, it's not just gonna be eight to the two x. It's gonna be times the natural log of whatever that number is. So times the natural log of eight. Um, since I didn't use just an x, since I used a two x, the chain rule also applies. So also, again, times the two. Right, I would probably put the two up front because again, it looks nicer there. Just note that two times eight to the two x is not the same as 16 to the two x. Like I can't multiply those two together because that eight has a power. I could even make it up, eh, I'll just leave it like that. If you didn't catch it, I've been doing this for a bit now, that little carrot is a shorthand for showing an exponent. That's eight to the exponent of two x, eight to the two x power. All right. Uh, natural log, same thing. Derivative of natural log is 1 over x. If it's anything other than base e, right, natural log is a log base e, log base a, it's 1 over that x times a natural log of a. Same rules up here. Just make sure that natural log of a goes in the denominator down here. That's, that's the one people tend to forget. They're like, oh, where's that natural log of a go? Some people put it at the top and oh, it goes down in the denominator when you're doing with, when you're dealing with log of a different base. Again though, um, this year's AP exam is unique. You are allowed notes. So having these ones in here for just a quick reference to, to especially like look at that one and say, oh wait, I wanna make sure I get that right. Probably would be a handy thing to have. All right, trig derivatives, I expect you guys all have memorized. We've talked about them a lot. Derivative of sine is cosine, derivative of cosine is negative sine and so forth. 
The one that people seem to get tripped on for whatever reason is secant, because it's got a secant in it, right? Derivative of secant is secant times tangent. Uh, so just make sure you got those down. And then inverse trig derivatives, the one I know you guys love so much. They look like this. Uh, again, super handy that you're allowed open notes on this because these are the ones people just forget or don't study well enough. And then when it shows up, they really struggle with it. Uh, the key to these ones, especially since you don't have to have them memorized anymore, would be having this available and just being having them memorized well enough that you recognize them super fast. I'm not sure if they're going to have an inverse trig derivative on the AP exam, but it's possible. And as long as you recognize this, like, hey, I've got one over the square root of one, right? Something like this, you can you can look it up. Like, oh, wait a minute, that looks like it might be one of these. Spend two seconds looking it up. Um, again, I don't know that it's terribly likely they're going to show up on this year's AP exam, considering how short it is. But if it did, it'd be really handy to have this here just so you could double check. All right. So. Uh, AP problems will typically be worded in a way that um, checks how well you know your rules. Instead of just straight up, straight up asking you to do a chain rule problem, they'll give you something like this. And they'll say, hey, suppose the functions f and g have the following values. f of negative 1 is 4, g of negative 1 is 2, f prime of negative 1 is 7, f prime of 2 is 5, and g prime of negative 1 is 3. And they go like, and then they say, what's the value of f of g of x at x equals negative 1? Take a breath. Relax, this is not a hard problem. It's really saying, what's the derivative of f of g of negative one, right? It's wanting to know what's the derivative of this thing at negative one. Well, if I look at that, that g of the negative one is inside the f function. That's a chain rule problem. Chain rule says you take the derivative of the outside, inside stays the same, and multiply by the derivative of the inside. So it ends up being derivative of the outside. If the outside is f, derivative would be f prime, right? Inside stays the same, so it'd be f prime g of negative one, times, chain rule says times by the derivative of the inside. Well, inside was a g of negative one, so times g prime of negative one, right? g prime being the derivative. So then all we need to do is plug these things in. Oh, no, I did hide it. I knew I did. All right, so it actually equals f prime of two times g prime of negative one. This two, in case you're wondering, comes from the fact that g of negative one is just a value they gave me. G of negative one, hey, that's two. So then filling this out, this is the part I didn't actually hide. All right, filling this out, f prime of two is just a number. f prime of two is right here, that's five. Times g prime of negative one, that's up here, that's three. The answer is just five times three, which is 15. Implicit differentiation, that's just finding the derivative when your equation isn't a nice y equals equation, which is called an explicitly defined equation. That's why that's there. Uh, remember with implicit differentiation, the product rule, the quotient rule, the chain rules, they always apply whenever you're doing the derivative. So for an example right here, this is asking what's the slope of the tangent line to the ellipse with this equation at the point 1, 5. So hey, it asks for slope. Basically, as soon as they said, I'm asking for a slope, I can kind of read through this really quick. Like, yeah, it's an ellipse, big deal. I just want to know the slope of this equation at that point. If I want slope, I need to find the derivative. Derivative of x squared, that's easy. That's 2x. There it is right there, 2x. Minus sign, minus sign. Here's where people forget it. This is a product, right? Product rules first times root of the second plus second times root of the first. First is x. Derivative of y is dy dx. That's why I wrote that there. Plus second times the first. Second is y. Derivative of the first. Derivative of x is just one. Now you guys might remember when we first started talking about implicit differentiation, we said, hey, the derivative of x could be dx dx, like derivative of y is dy dx. But dx over dx is just one, so we never bothered writing it. Plus, Derivative of y squared follows the same rules as x squared. Derivative of x squared is 2x. Derivative of y squared is 2y. However, chain rule, there is something inside that squared function. There's a y. And derivative of y is dy dx. That's why this showed up here. Same thing as before. If I really wanted to, I could have had a dx dx right here. But dx dx is 1, so why bother? And then this is the one that I warned you about, that people tend to just make goofy mistakes on. Derivative of 21, 0, because 21 is a constant. 
Uh, next step, I just distributed that negative, make it look a lot nicer. The whole goal is to find the derivative, right, which is dy dx. So I want dy dx by themselves. So the next step is to keep these ones with the dy dx together on the left side. And that 2x and that minus y, I threw them over on the other side, right? Get rid of the minus y by adding y. Get rid of the 2x by minusing 2x. Get them over here. Then I've got two terms with the dy dx. You can factor those. Factor the dy dx out. And then I just have dy dx times negative x plus 2y equals this stuff. Pretty easy to get dy dx by itself now. Just divide by that. And you got the, your derivative is y minus 2x all over negative x plus 2y. Uh, specifically, I want the derivative at this point. So just plug those values in. dy dx in this particular case. Uh, I don't like this one as much. That's right. Use the other one next time. y is 5. So it's going to be 5 minus 2x minus 2 times 1. So minus 2 divided by negative x well x is one so negative one plus two y y was five so plus ten right five minus two that's three negative ten plus one that's negative no oh, it's positive nine what am i talking about three ninths well that's the same thing as one third right there all right, sketch the inverse of this function. So here's a function here. You guys might remember the inverse of a function will always be reflected over the line y equals x, right? It's something we talked about last year and this year again. So if my function looks something like this, the inverse would be a flip over that line. It'll look something like this. All right. uh, you guys might also recall if I had a point up here, let's just call this point, I don't know, let's call it, three comma five. I don't write with a mouse very nice. But at that point, three comma five was there. When it flips over this line, it'll land right there and it'll be the point five comma three. The calculus is about slopes. So you guys might remember if I look at the slope of this line, let's just make a number up for that. Let's call that slope. I don't know, that's pretty steep, so big number. Let's say that's a slope of three, right? Let's say three is equal to that slope. Well, if I flip over here, I can see that this slope is very much not steep. It's kind of the opposite. That slope at that line, instead of being, it is related, but it is definitely not three. It is the inverse, or not the inverse, reciprocal, one over three. So let's summarize. All right, inverse functions are reflections over the line y equals x. There it goes, that circle again. Sorry to waste your time. There it is. All right, if point A, B is on f of x, then the point blank is on the inverse function f inverse of x. Again, that was like a for the th five threes was on one point, then the flip is on my other. So if AB is on F of X, then B comma A is on the inverse function. And last but not least, if F of X and G of X are inverse functions, then what's true about F of G of X? This one we didn't really talk about in this sketch back here, which I wish I had saved, but I didn't. Uh, if they're inverse functions, inverse functions undo each other. Right? So whatever this g does to the x, if they're inverse functions, that f is going to undo it. You're going to end up right back where you started. You're going to end up right back at x. So if it ever asks you to check to make sure you have inverse functions, just do a composition of the functions. f of g of x, do a little simplification. You should end up right back at x. Like you should just get a value of x. Uh, if you wanted a quick example, I could say f is you could, have, let's say, I don't know, 3x plus 1, f inverse, f inverse, that's a horrible way to do it. Uh, f inverse would be undoing that. I believe it would be x minus 1 divided by 3, right? I had to do the opposite of adding the 1, which is subtracting the 1. I had to do the opposite of multiplying by 3, which is dividing by 3. 
if I wanted to check if those are inverses, let's just call this one D instead of F inverse, because I don't know for sure, right? I just made those up. If you wanted to check if they're inverses, you could do F of G of X. Find out. Well, F of X is three X minus one. So F of G of X would be instead of three times X, it'd be three times G of X, which is X minus one over three. And then that plus one, so then plus one. And I say, well, this three and that three, they're gonna cancel out. So that'll just be X minus one. And then still plus that one. Well, and minus one plus one, that's gonna cancel out. And I just end up with X. What do you know? They actually are inverse functions. All right, so the biggest part for calculus, F and G of X are inverses. Sorry, if f, and g, f of x and g of x are inverses and point AB on f of x has a slope of m, then we know what that related point has, the, the slope of that. So if AB is on f of x, B comma A is on g of x. And if the slope, if the slope at A comma B and F had a slope of m, the slope on its inverse function was the reciprocal the flip, it would have a slope of one over m, right? Not a hard thing to do, um, but it can be confusing and people, people can get lost in what they're doing. Uh, so we'll do a quick example to help just kind of hit that home. Um, again, the AP exam this year, don't know if they'll have something on it, but if, they, if you have this as a quick reminder, like a, a quick sheet that, uh, that you can look at for things like, hey, I'm afraid I might forget it. Now you, it might be nice to have it there. Just make sure you don't assume just because it's on your sheet that you're definitely gonna use it. There is definitely a chance they're not gonna ask derivatives of inverse functions on this year's exam, considering how short it is. Um, normally they have at least, normally they'll have one question on it, maybe two, not a lot. Um, and they might have a question on it this year. Uh, so we should probably cover it. Here's an example. Um, they say f of x is four over x plus two and g is the inverse of f. And then it's asking about g prime of 10. So we know that on G, the point N comma something has a slope of something. And I don't know a lot there, right? It's asking, it's asking about the slope. Like this is what I wanna find. I wanna find what is the slope on, slope for uh, whatever that point is on, is on G. Like, I don't know. So it didn't give me a lot of information. However, since they are inverses, we can do some things about for f. We know they're related. If 10 comma blank is on g, that means on f there's a point that's related, but instead of 10 comma blank, it'd be that blank comma 10, right? And I could actually figure out what that point is. I can say, all right, well, I put some value in to get a 10 out, so I could say, all right, all right well, here's my formula for f, I could say, I know four over x plus two, I put some x in, I'm gonna get a 10 out, I can find out what point that is. Subtract two from both sides, I get four over x equals eight. Uh, that's uh, four divided by one half is like four times two, x must be one half. There's lots of ways to find that, I can, you can figure that one out, but x is equal to one half, and I could say, oh, well this point on f, that's just not any blank times 10, that is the point one half comma 10, which if I cared, that meant on G, the point that is that correlates to that one would be 10 comma one half, right? But again, I really wanted to know what F prime of G was at 10. I wanna know what the slope was. So for that to matter, I need to find the slope on F. Well, this is really the slope at an X value of one half. So it's really asking for what F prime of one half is over for that slope. I can find that out. F prime of X. This, uh, you know what, before I do F prime, that's four over X, we've talked about this a lot. A lot of times when you're doing calculus, instead of having four over X, it's nicer to write that as uh, four times X to a power, X to the negative one. Because then when I do F prime of X, okay, so I can see that prime, it's a little easier. The negative one comes down, I'm gonna get a negative four. And instead of X to the negative one, now it's X to the negative two. 
derivative of a constant to zero, so that's just f prime. Uh, if you want, you can put it back into algebraic notation just because sometimes the algebra is easier when it's written the other way. I could rewrite it as four divided by x squared, right? Because x to the negative two is like x to the two on the bottom in the denominator. Um, but very particularly for this point at one half, I want to find f prime of one half. Which means you plug a one half in there, so four divided by one half squared. Well, that would be you can see that. That would be four divided by one fourth, because one half squared is one fourth. Flip and multiply, I end up getting sixteen. Well, if the slope on F is 16 at 1 half comma 10, the related point on G is gonna have that reciprocal slope. So, oops, did I lose my negative four? I did lose my negative four. That was negative, that was negative, that was negative. My bad, this would have been a negative 16. I apologize. All right, so if the slope on F is a negative 16, then the slope on G would be just a reciprocal, negative 1 16. All right. Next, if a function is continuous, then it is differentiable. Is that true or false? That is false. It could be true, but just because something's continuous doesn't mean it's differentiable. The other one is true. If a function is differentiable, then it's continuous. That part's true. Um, so any differentiable function is always continuous because you guys might remember when you're trying to find when a function is not differentiable, there's really four things to look for. Corners, cusps, vertical asymptotes, discontinuities. Um, those are when a function is not differentiable. Now you notice at a corner, at a vertical asymptote, at a cusp, those are all instances where you can have a continuous function, but it's not differentiable. That's why this part was false. If a function is continuous, that doesn't make it differentiable. There could be a corner, there could be a cusp, there could be a vertical tangent. There's problems there. Uh, however, if it's differentiable, it has to be continuous because if it's differentiable, it doesn't have that discontinuity. If it doesn't have a discontinuity, that means it's continuous, right? That's why all differentiable functions are continuous. All right. Normally, I'll leave put cusps as number two. It's going to be bother me if I don't, so bear with me. You can skip ahead or do a fast one to fix it. Cusps. There we go. Vertical tangents, discontinuities. It doesn't matter how you order them, but I like them ordered like that. All right, question like that one. It says the graph y equals f of x above consists of three quarter circles and a line segment. For which values of x in the open interval Interval is f not differentiable. So just look for your problems. Corners, cusps, discontinuities, vertical tangents. Um, so the big ones, sometimes I can give you hints here, like if you look at the multiple choice, you're only looking at point zero, at point two, and point four. So you can look at those. At zero, that's a flat line, that's not a problem. Derivative zero, so that's, that's fine. But at two here, we got a problem right there. This function is going up and up and up, briefly vertical, and then down that is a vertical tangent right there. So it is not differentiable at two. And at four, and there's another problem there, that is a corner, a sudden change in slope. That is not gonna be differentiable. So we've got two problems, vertical at tangent at two and a corner at four. So it's not differentiable at two and four only. Just like that, you've got some derivative problems to practice on the AP exam. Definitely give those a shot. Uh, I think I've got them spread out over two days, so you got some time. Uh, correct them, take a look at the answer solutions. If you're not sure if you got them wrong, make sure you understand how to get them right so that you can uh, do a good job reviewing your derivative stuff. Next will become applications of derivatives in a couple of days. See you then.